we need to hit it actually. Okay, this is an interview with Art King in Bakersfield. Um, and we're talking about what life was like back back then, a long time ago. Um, let's start out with, with, with some of your early memories in, in Oklahoma before you even got out here. You were, you were telling me that, that your family moved to town, they lived at the top of the hill, and then gradually things got worse. Tell me a little bit about that. My memory goes back to uh, I was five years old, and it would be 1928, and uh, Dad had moved in from a farm to Oklahoma City and started contracting. And that's where I first started to school, and we kind of lived on North 23rd Avenue, which at that time is like panorama here in Bakersfield. The lower part is more working people, and as they progressed in their wealth, but they go up and get on top of the hill, well, we about maybe got halfway up. and. Uh, that's when the depression hit, I remember, and uh, Dad was a, a roofing contractor, and he had uh, trucks and all the equipment, and all of a sudden, repossessors came and took everything. And uh, we was, of course, he didn't own anything. He had it all on debt, credit. So we went down, 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 and we got down along the Canadian River in, in, uh, around Packingtown in Oklahoma City, and uh, we lived under the bridges. and. There was a big dump there, and we went over and got car bodies at the edge of the dump, and we made shelters and out of cardboard. And there was thousands of people in the same class we were in. And we found out that it was almost impossible at that time for one family to make enough, get enough food to eat. So four or five families would go together and, uh, and like pool their resources and make a big pot of stew or something like that and of course a lot of us was fishing the rivers and getting fish and making fish chowder and stuff like that or just stew and you frying tell fish. Me at one point there was some relief money and you had to go and get it yourself. When there was a soup line there. and start okay. it. Go ahead. Yeah they started in the winter time the soup line started up right along Canadian River run through Oklahoma City and uh, under the May Avenue Bridge and it was snowing and it was cold winter that winter, and the mom would wrap my feet and legs with the uh, papers and rags, and I'd stand in the uh, soup line all day long from about eight till just before dark, before I could get my turn to get a, a loaf of bread and a bucket of, of soup, and then I'd carry that home to mom and dad. Dad was sick and mother was sick and had a lot of little brothers and my elder sister, and. Uh, we survived all winter, things like that. <clears throat> then at a certain point, it's, uh, some, somehow somebody starts getting an idea that maybe California is the answer. What, how did people in, Cal in Oklahoma hear about California? Well, the way, they, the way we heard about it was a lot of people were talking about it. They had picked up these uh, pamphlets that the, was being distributed all over the country and dropped from airplanes and everywhere you went, uh, big sign posters. To, Fruit pickers wanted in California, good wages, uh, good housing, uh, things like that, and so everyone just began to get up their old Model T Fords or whatever. And we had, Dad had two acres at uh, one time out there, but anyway, he sold it and uh, got this old 27 Model T Ford tour. And, and there was six, eight in our family, and uh, there was another family that didn't have any a car of three. So 11 of us got in that Model T Ford, if you can believe it, and headed to California. You, you were telling me that he actually had to put sides on. And Built up sides all the way, and everything was just, he had a hole cut in there to put the kids in, pull them out. And I rode the right front fender with a big rock in case it was going uphill and it couldn't go any further. I'd get out and chalk the wheel real quick so it wouldn't roll back. And that was my job. And <laughs> but you weren't traveling very fast. I mean, no. Like, those things wouldn't do 60 miles. If we made 25 miles a day, even when we had the gas, we were lucky. It would go three miles, and the tire would blow out, and we'd have to get out and patch it. We had more patches than we could have find on the car. You tell me one story about, about um, I guess, in New Mexico, coming over the hill at the last <laughs> yeah. yeah, a truck. We, we got stalled going up. We couldn't go any further. The old Model T just wouldn't pull it. And uh, a truck came by and says, get in, I'll push you up the top. And he pushed up the top, but he kept pushing and was going down. And Dad wasn't a, a good driver at all, and there was no brakes on that thing. And I, if I remember correctly, that hill was about 10 or 12 miles long. You could see Las Cruces going in. And this was about midnight, and uh, fortunately, there wasn't too much traffic on the road. But anyway, we started picking up speed going down that thing, and Dad was like this, and Mom was screaming, and the kids was ah, all over the place, no Model T flopping, and 
everything and wind blowing us. And anyway, we finally coasted about, I guess, about a good 12, 13 mile before we finally pulled over and stopped. But the truck driver must be laughing. <laughs> well, I'm sure he had no idea he had brakes or something. Probably, but. How are those things in? Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about about what what that experience was once you hit the road and, and how people treated you and what kinds of things you ran into. Well, even in Oklahoma, the camps, uh, it took us, seemed like, forever to get out of Oklahoma and from one state to the other. It took about six months, really, to get to Arizona from the time we left Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. And it was camps. We'd go a, a little ways, and uh, maybe if we could stir up a gallon of gas somewhere and go down to Ford, we'd go, and we'd just pull over and push it off the road someplace and stop, and other people would come by, and they'd stop. And people were helpful, and uh, so we'd all just kind of stay together like a covered wagon, and so... Uh, Anyway, they, we had the camps like that, and... and right. yeah. Okay, let's stop. <clears throat> so let's continue with the story of some of your experiences on the road. And you, you were just telling me about how, how people who were traveling got together and supported each other, but, but I, I want to hear about the other side of the coin. How did the people in the communities you were going through respond to... Okay, sure. Well, we would, usually when we would run out of money, we'd, a lot of people seemed like they'd run out of money at the same time, we would make a camp, usually outside of a town, if we could find a creek or a river nearby, which is where we usually tried to get it, but sometimes just alongside the road. Of course, people had to go into town, and they were broke, they were hungry, they tried to find work, and I've had the, we've had the uh, police to escort us out the edge of town, says, we don't want you in this town. And uh, a lot of the people in the, in the businesses called us filthy scum, dirty, rotten, stinking okies, and all that superlatives that you have to put up with. Why, why, do you think they, why do you think they treated you that way? Anymore? There was something strange to them. We were different. Uh, we were poor. We were dependent on people for help. And uh, they didn't want no one coming in their town disturbing their uh, peace, I suppose. Uh, they wanted, but on the other hand, in the farming towns, they wanted us to work. But they didn't want us to go downtown. Mm -hmm. Walk the streets. We'd have people stop the cars and get out and says, "Get out of here! We don't want you walking our streets." Things like that. You, you were telling me that sometimes there'd be an incident in town, and then the police would come in and go through the camp. And That's right. They'd come through the camps, uh, just two or three carloads sometimes, and uh, we had campfires, and we had try to have if we had anything to cook a stew out, we had it on the fire cooking or the coffee if we had coffee. And sometimes just heating water, and they'd come through and shoot holes in our cans, kick the uh, buckets over, and, and put the fire out. And uh, if someone stood up and said something, they'd beat them up. And uh, so we just we were cowed. Uh, we were scared to make a move, do anything, unless they wanted you to stay and work. Unless we wanted they wanted us to work, and then the working conditions was it wasn't nothing like they advertised. All those beautiful ca uh, furnished homes, they said, are furnished cabins and good wages. Uh, it was a dirt floor, uh, a, maybe a barrel with a stovepipe coming up through the top, and uh, sometimes even had armed guards and gates. You couldn't even get out once you got inside the camp. You had to work so long. And they'd pick you up in trucks and take you out to the fields before, da before daylight, bring you back at dark. They'd give this script money that you could spend it only in their camps. Uh, of course, we had to go to the store every night and buy their stuff, which was four times higher than it normally should have been. They took every penny we made. The whole f We worked by families, not as one, one person. And the more you had in your family, the better chance you had of, of working. So everyone earned their bread, so to speak. Even the little two- and three-year-old children was going on picking up whatever it had to be done. So everyone worked. And we was, I remember this one camp, we was there almost a month. And uh, when we left, they said they owed, we owed them $2 at the store. Dad put up a fuss and uh, they finally wound up giving us a gallon of gas and kicked us out and went on down the road to the next camp. And you'd been working there? we have been working there, yes, yeah. every day. You were saying that the women would actually have to take the kids into the fields when they were picking cotton? That's right. The women, everyone was in those fields picking the cotton, uh, whatever it was doing, daylight till dark and before daylight and after, after dark. And. Uh, Oh, the, and then we got to some camps in the bigger, got into Arizona and where the fruit and the vegetables were, then they were begin to really get persecution. And uh, then when we came over to California, we really got it worse than ever. 
Well, but do you remember when you finally got to California? Was that like supposed to be the promised land? Well, it was land? been the promised land, and all we saw was Let's just... start over again. I don't know if you could. Yeah, we come into California, and they stopped us at the line, and they had cars Excuse lined. Did, would you just say, that come to California, it was supposed to be the promised land, then go on? Yes. We came to California, it was supposed to be the promised land. We thought it was going to be rich, and our words were going to be over at that time. But boy, it was, we found out differently. It was just, uh, just the opposite. And to get a job, we were lined up, and they would come in. But a, a farmers, or union, I don't know whether union men or not, I don't think they were, because we had two groups. That we had uh, men that was working for the farmers. to get. They were evidently getting paid to get so many people. I don't know what you would call them. Uh, and then we had union people coming in and telling us not to work for those wages they were offering. The, they they had advertised maybe uh, 25 cents an hour. When we get in there and get a lot of people in, they'd lower it down to 10 cents an hour, and we couldn't do anything about it. And uh, so if we would quit, well, they, sometimes they'd beat you up really good before you they let you go. But the cars were lined up at the at the border, and it, uh, uh, these guys were accompanied by two two or three big burly officers. And uh, they would look in your car and says, you won't work. How many's in your family? Things like that. And they'd look us over and, and uh, say, OK, get in this line here and follow that line of cars. And after about four or five hours waiting there, then they had enough. So uh, officers in the lead car and some of these other guys would follow, and then some behind us. And uh, so they'd take us into this camp, maybe 15, 25 miles away where it was at. And they would assign us to one of these huts. And then uh, they tell us, OK, you can go down to the store and get, get your food. And they write your name and your hut, hut number and your car, car license number and all this and how many's in your family and take the names of everybody. And they'd say, start, work starts at 5 o'clock in the morning. We'll be here in the truck and be ready. And we'd load up in the truck and they'd take us to the fields. And they'd bring us back. And they'd give us how many how much script money we made that day, they'd give us some, we'd go to the store. I don't know whether he's paying full or not, but no one, we, did, we couldn't take uh, track of it. We didn't know what we, were, we had to take what they gave us. So uh, that's the way it went, and uh, people, of course, tried to, some of the young men would try to go out of the camps, and sometimes they'd get caught, and they'd beat them up. And uh, there was a, quite a uprising in the camps, people, hear people screaming throughout the night, and maybe some of these guards coming in had eyed maybe a beautiful young girl or something and taking her, just forcefully taking her where they wanted to take her, when? And no one could do anything about it. It was a very sad thing. Did, did everyone get through the border? Or, or? A lot of them never made it. They wouldn't, uh, wouldn't even let them across. Now, now eventually they might have, but they held them up. Uh, the second time we came out, we were held up four days right there before they let us pass over. And they went through everything we had, piece by piece by piece, unloaded it all, and then we we had to load everything back. They wouldn't do that, but they just took things through and like this, looking, seeing what we had. And a lot of them taking what they wanted of what we had, if we had anything. Mom did have some personal heirloom that she had. Her mother and herself and other women had, had uh, uh, quilted quilts and those little doilies and things like that, and mother was keeping keepsakes. A lot of those were taken. Those people said there was cotton in them, and so they couldn't bring them across. And, uh, so they'd take them themselves and take them home. I know they, they weren't destroying them. <laughs> so it was, it was things like that. And then. Uh, so, like, you were just vulnerable in that situation. They could do it pretty much. We were com totally helpless. You felt like nothing and nobody. They made you feel that way. And uh, the more they tramped on you, the, a lot of the people got mad and fought back, but it was a losing battle. They'd bust you over the head with their big sticks, if it was a man especially, and uh, knock the fight right out of you. You were scared to make a move. And but, that's pretty much the same thing with, with the union organizing. You couldn't win those strikes. Could you? That's right. You couldn't do it. They would come through in car loads of big men that looked like come out of New York or Chicago. They wasn't uh, farm workers. They didn't know nothing about it. They were just ruling. They wanted to start a union, wanted to make you pay. And uh, it was, of course, then we had uh, like Woody Guthrie coming through, and he fought all of those guys and continually trying to get the workers there to stand up for their rights and things like that. And, did, put, did someone like Woody mean something real special to you? People? You bet he did. What, what did he mean? Well, it's just like uh, a Robin Hood, and so to speak, to me. It was uh, 
He was trying to tell us the way out of our problems and our troubles. Stand up and fight back. Don't give in to those warlords, things like that. And uh, of course, that was my ambition when I got old enough. I was going to fight too and for the poor people. And I've had that feeling all my life. And it never has left me. I still believe that uh, the poor, the working poor, is still very sadly neglected in a lot of ways and kept, in, kept down even though they have a lot of ability now and a lot of more educated. But at that time, if you had a second or third grade education, you were considered a pretty smart person. We just didn't have the schooling. We didn't, couldn't, couldn't go to school because it was traveling around all over the country. Dad would, if we was any place at all, he'd put me in school, but he needed me to help him work. So he dragged me out, and I uh, barely made it to the sixth grade. I never did go to the sixth. I just passed into it. But uh, then I didn't, uh, that was my schooling until I got up, went in the Navy during the war. And, well, and, and even when you were in school, it wasn't so We're going to run off. Okay, let's, let's change. Okay. That's <coughs> later. <coughs> okay, it's so Art King, take three. Um, Art, one of the stories you told me before, it, it was a real sad story, but it, it really got to me, was, was Again, it's, it's more on the trip out when, about when your family broke up and you were hitchhiking and, and that mm -hmm. whole experience. Would you, would you tell me some of that? Sure. Our old Model T broke down in, uh, I believe it was Denton, Texas. And we're, I mean completely, we wouldn't run another. And Dad sold it for $6. It was all along the highway with a person belonging. And a man and his wife came by with a new Model T truck with a covering over the back. And he stopped. And, Asked us where he was going. He said, we was heading for California, but the car broke down. He said, do you have any money? And Dad said, I have $6 just got for the car. And uh, I think all together he had maybe $10, including that. And they said, well, we're going to California. We have plenty of room. It's real nice people. And he uh, said, just load up in here, and we'll take you out there. Give me the money, and I'll buy the gas, help buy the gas, and I'll take you out there. So we got to Big Spring, Texas that day. It wasn't very far. And we made camp. He said, well, we'll make camp here today, and we'll stay all night to get an early start in the morning. Well, he and his, we got all out, everything out. And he and his wife uh, said, we're going down to the store to get some things. We'll be back in a little while. Never saw them since. So they took off and left us there again, stranded with, this time with no money at all. So we had to stay there uh, quite a while before we could. We had all, Mom had trunks of things that she finally found a woman that would let us store them in her basement. And uh, so here we were on the road and again, and we tried staying together to get rides, and we just couldn't get a ride. The whole family, there's eight of us, and, uh, dirty kids. And Mom had uh, cooking some potatoes in a big iron skillet around the campfire, had spilled the hot grease on her leg from her knee down, and it was just a solid sore. But anyway, she could hardly get around, and she just had it wrapped in old rags and things like that. And couldn't get any doctors to help at all. We tried going to hospitals, and they wouldn't treat her at all. So anyway, Dad said, well, the only thing we can do is we'll split up, and we'll meet every 200 miles down the road or something like that. And he took my oldest sister and my brother next to me and left Mom with me and my three little brothers. <laughs> I didn't think that was quite fair, but he did. and. Uh, so they caught a ride first. They were ahead of us, and somebody passed us up and picked them up. So we went about three days, and finally we got a ride 90 miles to the next town. I think it's Van Horn and Pecos, Texas, between Pecos and Van Horn. at an old desert. And so we got to Van Horn, <coughs> and Mom says, let us out here. We're supposed to meet every so many miles. So we got out there and we looked all over for Dad and them. They wasn't there, couldn't find them. So Mom said, well, they must have went back looking for us. So we hitched hiked back where we started from. Nothing there, so we come back out again. We caught rides in, in, a, in an old wagon with a couple of Mexican Indian fellows. They took us somewhere way ungodly down an old dirt road all day to a little place, I believe it was in New Mexico somewhere that call, uh, called Quib Quebec or sort of with a queue, I remember that. And there's nothing there but a few old adobe buildings, and they were laughing when they put us out. And uh, we didn't see a car. We was there three days, didn't see a car. 
Finally, somebody came through a wagon, took us out again in a wagon. And then uh, we were on the side of the road when they turned off, and two Mexican men came by, and they were drinking and drunk. And they saw Mom and this kid, and they started trying to flirt with my mother. And she was scared to death, and we were scared. So we didn't get a ride that day, and so it started to get a night, and it was in a warehouse along the railroad track, and, and the, these guys were still hanging around, so Mom said, we gotta hide from those people. So we got under, the, under that old warehouse, and then they came looking for us at all during the night. We heard them looking and searching, and said, so, well, they've gotta be here somewhere, they've gotta be here somewhere. So we spent the night under, under that, and then the, the next day we got another ride in the wagon and finally got back to a main highway, and uh, we got a ride by a young couple that took us into El Paso, Texas. And how we made a circle around, I don't know. But we got back there, and then my mother, just beside herself, and uh, <clears throat> this, this couple gave us a ride. They were on their honeymoon, and they gave Mom a couple of dollars when we got out of the car. And we got in there about 2 o'clock at night, and the wind was blowing. And we was walking down the street, and two men walked past us. I remember this. They had black coats on, and they grabbed my hand and put two one dollar bills and didn't say a word just kept walking and we had four dollars so we saw this hotel so the room's 75 cents and up and we went up there and here it was two o'clock in the morning and the landlady came up and opened the door and we said we'd like a room and she looked us over and said we don't have any vacancy and and she there's a young man evidently saw us something he's across the hall and he opened his door and he listened to that and he walked up and he says here he said you don't want to stay in this dump he gave mom a $10 bill and said, it's a real nice hotel just right down the street. That woman looked just, she couldn't hardly believe it, you know. So we went down there. We did get a <coughs> fine room. And the next day, mom went to the Red Cross, the police station, hospital, everywhere she could think to find, try to find my, uh, my dad and my brother and sister. Couldn't find them, no luck. So I said, mom, let's catch a train. We can't hitchhike and if you pick us up. So she was scared to death just to mention the train, but we went down in the yards and uh, <coughs> El Paso on a, a, a yard bull, we called him at that time, uh, grabbed us and said, where are you guys going? Mom told him that her husband, we're trying to find her husband and other kids and we're going to Phoenix, Arizona. And he said, well, he looked us over and he says, that train is leaving pretty soon, he says, you can get on that. But we was waiting and uh, anyway, Mom just went hist hysterical all of a sudden and just crying and screaming, didn't know what to do and wanted to give up and the train was coming and she threw herself down on the track in front of the train. And I was see at that time probably ten, I guess. Anyway, I was trying to pull her off the track and uh, I was pulling with everything I had, screaming, my little brothers behind me were screaming and I don't know what saved it. It seemed like it's uh, extra strength or an angel or something. Just first thing is she was she was off the track and and then she, as soon as she was off, she started she grabbed and started screaming. She'd come to her senses, and it was that just that close of being run over. And I'd probably got run over too because I wasn't turning loose over pulling pulling her off. But anyway, caught the train and. Uh, and we went to another town, and the same way she did, she didn't believe that they'd go off and leave us. And we looked and looked all over them about a month. Mm -hmm. And finally, a deputy sheriff picked us up, and I told we told our story to him, and he put us in a rented room for us. And I guess he got on the hotline and uh, called uh, Phoenix and the little surrounding town, and Glendale and Peoria and Buckeye, and. Sure enough, Dad had went to them too, and so they had a record, so they got notified Dad, and Dad got the farmer that he was working for to, to come up and pick us up. We was, oh, probably 500 miles from there when he got us. Things like that, and. How much we got left on this? We got uh, three minutes. Three minutes. <clears throat> Tell me a little bit more about the, the train experience. You were saying that, that at one point there was. There was this incident where the guy tried to give you cookies and... Oh, yeah, there's some young man, it was, he had a little pack of cookies, and he, he sat down beside us when we got in this open coal car, and uh, it was half full of snow, it was real cold in wintertime. And we hadn't eaten, well, we ate a little bit that morning, but I was, you know, kids always hungry for cookies, and he gave me cookies, little animal cookies, I think it was. And uh, 
he gave the other kid some, and he seemed like a real nice young man. And it wasn't long after that he began to act crazy. His eyes would look crazy. He'd uh, look at me, and then first thing you know, he grabbed a hold of me, and he picked me up and started choking me. And then he picked me up on my ankles and started pounding my head uh, on the bottom of the boxcar, trying to, and mom screaming, trying to fight him off. And, and two young men uh, saw that, and they finally come over there, and they grabbed a hold of him. They didn't say a word. They just took him over to the side, just threw him off the train. And uh, he hit the sand dunes out there, and then uh, we saw him. He was running and jumping up and laughing and like a jackrabbit, hopping up and falling down, you know, hitting on his seat. And we were scared to death of him. Uh, we saw the, a truck pass the train later, and he was on the back of the truck. So we were scared to death that he was going to try to find us and kill us. <laughs> Well, you know, maybe he was just nuts anyway, but I mean, do you have a sense that some of that stuff brought out the worst in people? Or? I'm sure it did. It, it did. Uh, no, he had to be squirrely. Yeah. Uh, but the, everyone was hair triggers in those days, and nobody learned to not trust anyone. But a woman, you can imagine, uh, with uh, four little kids on the railroad with a bunch of bums, and there was a lot of just honest people riding the rails, too, just trying to find jobs. Didn't have any other means of transportation, but there were a lot of squirrelies on there, too. But for the most part, these people on the road were just ordinary people who had... Some most part, they were. And they were good, honest, hard-working people. They had no means of transportation, so they took to the rails. And uh, we did the same thing later. Dad and I rode a freight train over here from Arizona. Rode right through Bakersfield when I was 13 years old, looking for work. We went on up to Fresno. And found a little work there, and then was going back to Arizona to get to the family and bring them over. And he and I worked over here for about two months, I guess, and saved a little money enough to go and get them over. About ready to change? Yep. <coughs> okay, continuing with Eric King. Um, I, I guess I'd like to hear you tell me a little bit more about, you know, you were saying, Folks, nowadays when we talk about bums, we have a repu we have an image of someone who doesn't want to work, stuff like that. But, but the people on the road were really different. And people don't understand what, what kind of people they were. They were just hard-working people that were mostly farmers. Oh, I'm sorry? Truck or something. Okay, can we tell me when you're ready? Oh. Start okay. okay, go ahead. What kind of people were they? They were hard-working, honest people as a rule overall. That was farmers came from Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, that had made their own living from the land. They were promised great things would come to California, Arizona. That wasn't so. It didn't. Uh, it was just a big forest to get people out here. So the big conglomeration would have excess of laborers to do their dirty work for nothing or for peanuts. And ten cents an hour was very common. Uh, and once in a while, if if a grown man could get twenty cents an hour, it was. Uh, it was something just out of the ordinary. And I know I, until I went to, in the Navy, I was working out here in the field for 20 cents an hour, pitching hay, chopping cotton, picking potatoes, and uh, things like that. But, I mean, were people coming out looking for a handout, or were they looking for a way to... They were looking for work. And, of course, they had to be handouts somewhere along the line, and there's a lot of starvation. A lot of people died just from starvation. It was too proud to, to beg or to ask for help. And they treated those people, and uh, that's what I, I had a really a hard time overcoming the term Okie. And to me, an Okie meant uh, a dirty SOB. And uh, uh, I would say, someone laughingly called me a dirty, filthy Okie or something, I would say, I'm from Oklahoma. I'm not an Okie, I'm from Oklahoma. And what's wrong with that, you know? And I remember my grandfather and my father working the lands back there a lot, and I worked with them, and, and we were happy. We didn't make money, but we had food. Well, the lure of grandeur got us out, started out here. Of course, the big dust bowl hit, too. And that was another thing. We couldn't raise our crops. There was nothing to, no water, and uh, the topsoil was all blown away, and we, they were just dirt farmers that was nothing to farm, <laughs> nothing to raise, and then they couldn't. So they were welcome. That when that hit, the, the, the call for people come out, good wages, all the food you can eat, and good place to stay, and stuff like that. 
we just went crazy. That boy, that's the land of opportunity, land of the uh, world tomorrow. You know, the promised land. And uh, so we headed that way. And it was, and when you're dirty on the road, you're considered just a dirty, lowly bum. And but when we'd come to a canal or any kind of water, mom would always stop and scrub us kids clean as she could clean us. Not all women would do that. They had no hope or no energy left to do it. They just let themselves and everyone go. My mother did fight that. And she kept us clean as possible on the road like that. And uh, so we seem to have a few more morals in that respect than a lot of the others. But I have seen the bums. I mean, the, the bums stealing from the poor people, honest poor people, too. They were there, too. And always someone taking advantage or disadvantage. And but the most I saw was the authorities in the towns and uh, crooked uh, farmers, the law enforcement officers, or guards. I don't know whether they were paid by the city or the county, but they had guns and they had uh, big sticks and clubs and had to look like the authority and come out and knocking you around. And if uh, you if you wasn't working, they'd kick you out and they said, "Don't come back in this town. Don't let the sun go down on." on your back, and uh, they meant it, and they'd come out, boy, and just take you right out the edge of town and say, don't come back in. We were scared to go. I said, well, we have to get out of here. We have to go through some way, so sometimes they've escorted through the town, made sure we went on through. Did, Not um, bad. Did you hear your mom and dad ever talk, I mean, did they ever think, well, this isn't working out here, we should go back to Oklahoma? We did go back. Mm -hmm. uh, we came out the first time in 1932, when the Dust Bowl hit, and uh, we stayed in Arizona. Well, it, I don't know how long it took. We worked all the way out there. And then the winter hit in Arizona, and boy, we had nothing. And uh, Dad had an old 1923 Buick that he'd built a little bed on and covered it with a tarp. We lived in that, and but we didn't have any money to buy gas. And we was camped outside of Phoenix there in Peoria. And uh, the rain was just coming down real hard and flash floods and anyway the welfare has come out and they come through not only us but a big camp of people and they said anybody want to go back where they came from give us everything you've got and we'll put you on a train and send you back it's like a herd of cattle so they took our car and some other personal things that mom and dad had and bought us a train ticket with no extra money for food or nothing and we wound up back in Oklahoma City again and so we stayed there then until 1935 and then we that was 33, I think. Came back out and started out again in 35, and finally wound up here in the uh, last part of four, uh, 36. Now, from 36 on, it was pretty hard. When we talk about 38 or 39, did things start getting better then? 39, it did. Up until 39, uh, it seemed like the, the government began to build war camps and uh, army camps, and things began to go and begin to do little things like that. So I know I joined the Union finally in 1939. I was. You were saying that up, up until 38 or 39, you're still living in a tent, though, right? We lived in tents right here in Bakersfield along the river. We lived in tents right out in the cotton patch. Uh, they'd let us, at the end of a cotton patch, we could strict a little old tent and stay there. And uh, we'd, there were irrigation ditches there, so we'd wash in that and drink out of them and to pick cotton there till it was all over, and then we'd, we'd have to move on somewhere else. And we did that until. Uh, 19, almost 1940, before we finally got in the house. But <clears throat> then when I joined the union, I'd come out of the field working for 20 cents an hour, and the union wage was 86 cents an hour for labor. <laughs> I was in tall cotton then, boy. I was, that was more money than I ever saw in my life. And I was making, I think, uh, working 10, 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week, I'd had 35 or 40 dollars in my pocket to cash that check, and that went a long ways in those days. And that was because of the war, right? Right, the war. They began to prepare for war back in '39, and uh, I shined shoes and I built shine boxes for other kids before that, and did everything I could to get out of the fields. And uh, I worked at uh, a car lot as a car boy, and for eight dollars a week, I worked six days a week, 12 hours a day. I worked in a Brock department store as, and I wrapped packages, and that was really a good job. I got 18 a week on that, and from 9 to 5. 
So I worked there, and uh, I really loved that till I joined the union, and I got doing labor work, and um, we helped build the first Mew Rock. Uh, Edwards Air Force Base was called Mew Rock in those days, and I poured, worked on a concrete crew. We poured the first foundation out there in 1940, early 1940. Did, up until people got a sense that the war was going to change things, did, what did you think was going to happen? Were you just going to keep on like that? We thought there'd never be any change. You know, it had been from almost uh, 10 years of depression, and it seemed to get worse every year. And the people at the farmers right here, they worked us, but that's all they'd, they'd had no uh, compassion for us at all. And they wouldn't let us stay on their property once the work was done. And now we did find a few government camps, run camps, and have one in Oregon, had a chapter, and all around California, and that, that treated you halfway decent. You'd go in and take a shower, and uh, you don't know how important a shower is until you don't go a few weeks or months without one, <laughs> then you'll know. But things like that, and they had little houses that we got moved into. They uh, have trucks would come in and say, we need 25 people, 50 people today. We'd load up the trucks. They'd take us out at decent hours and bring us back to treat this nice. We still had mean row bosses and uh, farmers that, slave Beaters, you know, well, you, they didn't want you to look up for nothing. They wanted you to bend over and pick that but, cotton. But when you stayed in those government camps, was that a better, did you, you feel bet. like you weren't? Began to feel like a human being again. They had little dances there whatever, every weekend, every Saturday night. People would get their guitars and fiddles out and their harmonicas and start up the band and everyone start dancing, relief, all of that emotion and feel like a human being again. But it was the, I mean, those were nice times, and the kids, girls and boys your own age, played together, and that was good. And one of the, one of the main things there, they, they made you clean up. When we first went in that camp, you had to go to the showers and clean up before you could even get in the quarters they furnished for you. So that was good. But that was, that were exceptions. Most of them we went to wasn't that way at all. They were armed camps. You couldn't get out. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of government camps, was there? No. California is the only ones I saw. Them. I'm sure there might have been others along the way, but we never got into any of those. And uh, We heard of greener grass down the road, but we never found it. And, uh, green pastures apart. Green pastures, yeah. How are we doing on this, Nancy? Uh, just going to roll out. Okay, let's roll it out. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, so, before we go on, would you just say that one thing for me that you lived in a tent up until 1939 when you got your first job building the airport? Sure. We lived in uh, tents right along the Kern River, and uh, tent, and then we, uh, the willow trees used to grow a lot plentiful there. We'd take the willow trees and bring them down, tie them together, and then line them with post pasteboard boxes. And we lived in huts like that and tents along the river until 1939. And that's when I joined the Union, went over to, when they first started building Air Force Base in Vandenberg, too, and I went over there and went to work. And uh, my take-home pay, working uh, seven days a week, was thirty-nine seventy-five a week, clear money. That was pretty good money then, wasn't it? Excellent money. <laughs> I mean, you, you felt like you could, you could live on that. That's when you could buy a brand new Plymouth for $700, drive it off the floor. And, uh, you know, one thing we didn't we didn't finish up on because we changed magazines right then. You were telling me a little bit, we talked a little bit about school, but we really never finished it up. You know that, that you didn't have a chance to go to school very much, and and you really didn't give me the again the other side of the picture about how you were what what happened to you when you went to the school. Yeah, well, I got passed into the fifth uh, sixth grade in Oklahoma City the last time we were there, and I came out here, and uh, of course I was. Uh, 13 then, and uh, they, I didn't want to go to school then. I'd been out too long, and uh, so I was working, but then uh, the truant officer got a hold of me one day and made me go to, put me in a school, a little school out at Greenfield. And I went two weeks, but I gave the teacher such a bad time that I finally got expelled. And the little kids in my grade was four years younger than me, you know, and four or five <laughs> years younger. Younger. So you must have had mixed feelings. I mean, you would have liked to go into school if it could have been. I loved school when I first started going, and then, of 
course, the hard times came, Dad had to have me to work with him, and when he needed me to work, he'd take me out, and I'd be out a month or two and working, and then he'd put me back in. That doesn't, doesn't cut it. And I got to the point that I was so far behind, I was embarrassed because I didn't know what was going on. I, I couldn't keep up with him. So I began to get kind of hard and I don't need it, you know, attitude. And I went on that way until uh, World War II came and uh, I went in the Navy. Then I began to see I should have had more education and I began to do a little, do all I could in there, but during the war they don't have time to put you in school, they just train you to go to war. But then when I got out of the war, I went in the Army, and then I took some schooling, and I took classes, and I got my GED, and uh, then I came back home here, and I went to night school two years and got my di di uh, high school diploma. So, so it wasn't that you didn't appreciate education? Before, no. Just... No, I wanted to learn, and, and uh, it didn't bother me until I got up and started looking at girls, and uh, all of my kids uh, at that time was going to school. And I wasn't, the parents wouldn't let me date a girl if I wasn't going to school. So I began to feel the pressure and uh, the need to get educated. But of course, that went on. Uh, I didn't do it until after I was a grown man. But I finally did, and that's all that counts. And uh, it was quite a, quite a good feeling to be able to, uh, to show them people and get qualified to take an examination for a good job. And I finally did and got into law enforcement. When you look back at the whole experience, what <clears throat> what is it that stands out about about those years, those hard years? Well, of course, the the bad memories is seeing the, the uh, sick and dying people, starving to death. Uh, my mother, especially, and uh, other women, uh, saw that. But the strong points, I think, uh, you learn to survive, and. It, it probably made a better person out of me overall. After it was all said and done, I'm not doing, I didn't believe that during the time, I built up a hatred uh, against law enforcement, against the old authority, and it's taken me a lifetime and working as a police officer to overcome this because I took, went into police work for one reason and one reason only, to prove to myself that I could be a law enforcement officer and still be a, a human being treat the poor people with dignity, and uh, that is why I went in. And I proved it to myself after about eight years of it, and I resigned, and I hadn't. But, you know, going back to, to what you get from the experience, I mean, the classic example is when you try to tell your kids what it was like, and they don't <laughs> get it. What, what, do you, what do you tell kids? I try to tell them how hard it was and how, how it was to be out like that, no food for three or four days sometimes, and then just a bite here, a bite there of cornmeal mush or a pot of beans if you could, with no flavoring in them, no salt even sometimes. I've even eaten bark off of trees and tried grass and leaves and when I was a kid. I'd tell them things like this and i say, you don't have to go through those things. But my oldest son would say, well, Dad, you came through it all right. I'd like to be able to go through something like that. He actually uh, felt like he wanted to. So you really can't... Uh, your experiences only go so far with children. They have to learn their own way of life. And uh, of course we have our trials and tests now, the kids on the street, the dopes, they have to learn some character that way. We had to, we had to learn the other way just to survive. And now they have their homes and they have their nice warm beds and the three meals a day if they want to take advantage of it and respect their families and stay there and have it. We didn't have that then. We respected our families and we respected our relatives and we respected other poor people. But we did band together, and as a, as a unit of poor people banding together with the same survival and, and humanitarian thoughts in our minds, we made it. So there was a sort of a camaraderie. A bonding, camaraderie there that uh, people don't have anymore. We could sit around and, and uh, tell stories and cry and put our arms around each other, and, and then somebody would play a fiddle and get up and start dancing. And, you know, a lot of the people, when they got out here, even living in tents, they made their own booze and things like that. Uh -oh. I think we're going to stop for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's let's move back to Woody and, and music and, and what that meant. So okay. Tell me a little bit about how Woody's songs would relate to the to your life and what people were going through. Okay. Wait for this truck, please. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. This. Uh, 
one song, and during those days, everyone was making up songs. Woody Guthrie was going through the land singing songs that meant about people that was destitute and on the road and things like this. And everyone added to them uh, their own version of what he'd make up sometimes. This was one that uh, I remember that was made up, and I don't only know a, remember a small part of it. It went on a uh, long ways, but uh, <clears throat> this one kind of appealed to me because it speaks of Oklahoma. It'll go something like this. Back in 1927, I had a little farm that I called Heaven. The prices got high and the rains came down. I hauled my crops right into town. I bought clothes and groceries and went home to try to raise a family. Well, the rains quit and the winds got high and a dark old dust cloud filled the sky. So I traded that farm for a Ford machine. I filled it up with that gas Eileen and we started out just rocking and rolling right out California way. We got up there in a the tall piney woods, way up on a high rocky road. I thought to give that Ford a shove and figured to let her coast just for as she could, save on gas. Well, we went to coasting, picking up speed, hairpin curve. We didn't make it. <laughs> Man alive, I'm telling you, guitars and fiddles really flew. That Ford took off like a flying squirrel and flew halfway around the world. Scattered wives and children and dogs all over that mountainside. Well, we got up there on a hot desert road, that hot motor and a heavy load, going so fast it wasn't even stopping, jumping up and down like popcorn popping. We had a breakdown. Sort of a nervous breakdown, too. A mechanic fella down there says, engine troubles. Well, we got to California, we was a gall darn broke, so gall darn hunger thought I'd choke, but I rustled up a spud or two, and my wife, she made a th tater stew. Mighty thin stew. Always did think and always did figure. If that there stew had been just a little bit thinner, some of them California politicians could have read a magazine clean through it. That was that one of what I remember that, but it went on and on. And that, I mean, did people, did people say, yeah, that's, that's what it's about? Oh, right. yeah. Yeah, they'd, they'd listen to that part and then, oh, and then here's another verse, so they'd still uh, say a verse of their own experiences and things like that. And uh, that hair, hairpin curve going down that road remind me, we was coming, that truck pushed us over the mountain and uh, gave us that shove down. <laughs> well, we made it, but uh, a lot of things like that. And then there was one in, uh, here in California, Shafter, I don't know whether I said that to you or not, to, to tune the strawberry roan. Just hanging around chapter, just wasting my time Out of a job and not earning a dime When a stranger walks up and he says I suppose that you're a spud picker from the looks of your clothes Your guess is me right and a good one I claim Do you happen to have any of them old things? Yes, I have some spuds in a 40-acre patch If he wants you a job, just go get you a sack Oh, you spud picking fool Oh, you spud picking fool you turn your old back right up to the sun. They call you a spud picking son of a gun. <laughs> uh, another one. Let's uh, change before we do any more. I think we're just about out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah actually. <laughs> well, things is, is. Okay. All right. Mark King, pick seven. Let's have a tune. Okay, we'll try uh, This Land is Your Land by Woody okay. Guthrie. Streets of Laredo, uh, Danny Boy, Streets yeah. of Laredo, I, I yeah. play pretty fairly well. Yeah, that'd okay. be nice.
Nice. Laredo. Yeah. You like Danny Boy? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> That's one of my old favorites because I'm part <clears throat> Irish. <laughs> yeah. I can, uh, okay. I can pick it a little bit, but... Uh, just a little, just a little. Yeah, let's cut here. Okay. Okay, one second. And some music. Hold on one second. My curly-headed baby Used to sit on daddy's knee She's my curly-headed baby She's from sunny Tennessee Lord, I had rather be in some dark hollow Where the sun will never shine Than to see her in the arms of another when she promised to be mine She's my curly-headed baby Used to sit on daddy's knee She's my curly-headed baby She's from sunny Tennessee <clears throat> I, I wish I could pick sing with it, but I can't got, got a new... 
hobby. <laughs> yeah, I've got to get, got to go to work on it. Yeah. Take some lessons. Wouldn't take much, but. <laughs>